What is this love that won't relent? It's calling out with heaven's breath. Who's reaching out to save our souls? Only you. Ooh. What is this grace that makes no sense? That we could never recompense? Who gives us all a second chance? Only you, only you, only you. There is no one like our God. stars upon the night show the sun how bright to shine who shaped the world within his hands only you
Good morning, Open Bible Church San Jose. Welcome to our, <clears throat> our service. This is our week away from Easter, and we are prepping hard for uh, all of our visitors and all of our friends that will be coming to visit us Easter Sunday, and we're hoping and praying that you will join us next week, and as well as uh, hoping that you'll be praying for us as well for our service. Uh, we will be having an online service for Easter Sunday, uh, but we are hoping that if you're able to join us uh, in person, that you will be here at 930 as we talk about the view from the cross. We're going to be talking about the three uh, individuals out of, on the cross, Christ himself and then the two thieves, and I really truly believe that God has a powerful message for us uh, for that day. So. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about um, the, the way of the cross. And the, um, when you think about the time right before Jesus was going to the cross, think about the, um, the pain and the suffering that he endured at the hands of the Roman soldiers. In Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to be uh, reading from this morning. Um, Luke chapter 9 verse 18 talks about um, how Jesus uh, was prepping and preparing the disciples for uh, his, his coming. And, and so when you look at uh, verse 21, it, it, he talk, he's talking about uh, preparation for his death and leading up to the, the crucifixion. But it's interesting what he does in verse uh, 23. Uh, I want to read from chapter 9 of the book of Luke, verses 23 to 26. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever, whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit, lose or forfeit their very soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. When uh, Jesus was tortured and um, prepared for uh, his crucifixion, um, 
there's a requirement of all the criminals who were to be executed on, on the cross, and that was for them to carry their own cross from the, the place of judgment or their place of punishment to their place of death. And so they were responsible for carrying their own cross. There's uh, this road that they, that they walked on from that one place to Golgotha or the, the place of the skull was about 600 meters long. And there was this procession of people that were jeering and, and shouting and mocking each of these criminals as they were led to their death, uh, Jesus included. It, that road is called the Via Dolorosa, and it's called, uh, it's, it's translated the way of suffering. And uh, the interesting thing about this segment of scripture that we see in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, this has been uh, set apart, and it's called the way of the cross. And I found that interesting because it's talking about uh, the, the dynamic of the, how the cross is um, played out in our lives, not just at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, but at the time of how we live our life. And so whoever wants to be my disciple, he said in verse 23, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Daily and follow me. And I find that pretty interesting because I, I, I want to take a moment to talk about what that looks like. And the first thing I want to talk about, there's, there's uh, three points I want, to, I want to talk about. I want to talk about the calling. Um, I want to talk about the commitment. And then I want to talk about the cost uh, this morning. The calling, um, when you think about who Jesus is talking to, you go back there and he says, um, he said to them all, and in... Uh, Luke, excuse me, in Mark, it talks about, he said to the crowd that was there and to the disciples. So this message was not only to those who um, Jesus was trying to reach, but he, he was giving this message to those who already understood what it meant to be a follower of, of Christ, or were learning to be a follower of Christ. And um, I, I'm going to go back to the dynamic of uh, being called. We are called into ministry service, and I'm not talking about ministry service in the church. I'm talking about a full-blown, responsible life lived for Jesus. And, and that's what ministry is all about. We're not called to, to, to just believe, but we're called to follow. The disciples in Matthew chapter 4 Verses 18 to 22, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 19 says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Verse 21 says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So the disciples were called to follow Jesus. And this passage is given so that we are reminded that to follow Jesus requires a, a de decisive response of surrender and obedience. Just as the disciples left everything to follow him, we are called to prioritize our relationship with Christ above all else and leave behind our old ways and pursue his new ways and embrace his will for our lives. So this is kind of the, the idea, the dynamic of what we're going to be looking at this morning. I love what it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. This is a verse that is a constant reminder to me of God's calling on my life. And it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So we are called to be a follower of Christ. And the way that looks is, is that we are called to walk the way that Jesus walked, to live the way that Jesus lived. There's four things that we are called, uh, that we are called from. Uh, the first one is that we are called out of darkness to live 
in his wonderful light. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we are called out of a life of darkness into a life of light, to follow after the light of lights. And so we are called to be a follower of Jesus. You know the interesting thing about uh, Peter and John and James and, and Simon being called is the fact that they were, they were given a promise. They were called with a promise. And that's what the calling came with. It came with a promise that if you follow me, I will do this for you. I will make you fishers of men. So we're called out of the darkness to live into the light. The second thing, we're called to walk away from our old ways to embrace our new ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. So we are called to leave our old habits, our old lifestyle, to take on a new lifestyle that's found in Christ. And then the third thing is we are called to live as a believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17 says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. So that's a great uh, scripture. But what does it mean to live as a believer? How does a believer live? Uh, five ways that I came up with, and you can probably come up with more, but... Um, to live as a believer means you have to obey and be faithful to God. Obey and be faithful to God. Number two, you must be faithful to the church. In other words, to the others who are called. The third thing is you are, you are, um, you are to live a life that serves all others. Put others before you. Number four, you are to give generously. Scripture is very clear on our attitude of, of giving to give generously. And number five, we are to proclaim Christ by sharing the gospel with others. This is how a believer lives. He proclaims the message of the gospel, thus fishing for men. The fourth thing that, um, that we are called to, uh, to do is we are called to the mission of the church. So in other words, Matthew chapter 28 reminds us that we are to therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus' last words to the disciples were, go fish for men. Go fish for men. Be a fisher of men. In other words, you are called to fulfill the mission of the church. And then... Um, uh, I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20, the first part. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. So to be called is to be an ambassador of the message of the gospel that changes lives. That same message that changed your life. That same message that can change the lives of your loved ones, your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, people that you know, people that you don't know. When you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are called to be an ambassador of the message of Jesus and because we are called we have this we have this authority we have this great responsibility to um, to walk out our faith by carrying our cross daily by by living a called life the second main point that I want to make this morning is the fact that we are called to we're, we're called to fulfill uh, uh, the calling on our life and then we we have to be committed that's what Carrying the cross daily means. It means a, a, a commitment to living and walking out our faith. Um, when I think of commitment, the, probably one of the greatest levels of commitment I, I, I can think of is the commitment of marriage. And if I were to ask you, how is your marriage? How is your marriage? You may say, oh, pastor, I'm not married. Or you would say, hey, my marriage is going great. Or, um, yeah, it could be better. My, my marriage isn't doing all that great. And, and so um, my thought is, I'm not talking about your physical marriage, whether you're married or not, and if you are, how that's going. I'm talking about your marriage to Christ. 
When God talks about our relationship with him, he talks about it in several different dynamics. He talks about it in a, a holy and sinful place where God is holy, we are sinful. Talks about it in, in regard to a father and a son or daughter uh, instance. Uh, he talks about it as, as we are friends, that, that dynamic. But probably the, the, the strongest illustration of the relationship that God has for us is the, is the illustration of marriage. That Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. That Jesus is coming back as the bridegroom for the bride. When I read in, um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus is given a reference to the husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So Jesus is, is showing himself as the husband to the, to the bride or to the church in, in, in that relationship. As a husband to a wife, Jesus is to the, to the church. And uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And so Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride, the church, and we are, we are in a relationship with him that is reflective of, of marriage, that mirrors a marriage. And Jesus being, being the, the head of the, of the church, like the husband is the head of the home, he is the he's the lead. He is our he is our um, our savior in regards to that. So if I were to ask you, how is your reference? Excuse me. How would you reference your marriage to Christ? How's it going? How how is your marriage to Jesus going? Is it red hot? Is it lukewarm? Is it non-existent? Uh, maybe you're not married. Maybe you're just dating and, and you're just trying to, to figure it out. And, and you're not sure whether to make the plunge and, and get involved and make that commitment to Christ. Or maybe you're playing the field. Maybe you're just hoping for something better to come along. Or you're just not sure what's going to be better to come along, but you're not willing to make that commitment to him. Or maybe you're just kind of hanging out. And this is the danger of the church right here where I think we have a lot of people that are not committed in a marriage sense to the relationship between us and God. And the problem is, is that we got a lot of Christians that are just kind of hanging out in church. So I'm, I'm tempted to hang a sign uh, out, outside one of the doors here that says, no loitering, no loitering. And that would be a reflection of the fact that just don't come to hang out. Just don't come to take up space, but be committed. Be committed to a relationship with the living God. That's why you are called to take up your cross daily for him. Because it is a, it is a supreme commitment to what God has called us to do. So when we commit ourselves to Christ, we, we commit ourselves to what I call the sanctification process. And what that means is, is we are, to be sanctified means to be cleansed. There's a lot of our lives that are just filled with all kinds of garbage, filled with sin and, and, and all this general dynamic that needs to be cleansed. We need to be sanctified. So we need to be committed to that sanctifying process. There's, a, there's an expression called dead man walking. So if we are to die daily to Christ, if we are to give up, take up our cross daily and follow him, Paul also calls, calls us, and I believe it's in Galatians, to call us, calls us to die daily for him. And what that means is, is we are dead men walking, and, and a dead man walking is somebody who is, doesn't have long to live. In other words, they have a, uh, they have a, um, a hit out on their lives, or they, um, you know, something's going on, and, and they're just not going to see it through, and so they're, they're a dead man walking. Bach, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And so when we are called to be a follower of Christ, we are called to, to die to ourselves. And what does that look like? I love what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. Paul wrote, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, goes on to say, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So we are called to be committed to the sanctification process to be cleansed of our old ways so that we can learn how to walk in our new ways. So through this, we are cleansed through repentance. When, when we recognize our sinful behavior, when it says here to put to death what we do is, is we, we crucify those on the cross uh, figuratively and we come before God and we repent of our behavior. And that idea of repentance is just not seeking um, resolution for our sins, absolution for our sins, but we're repenting in order that we might um, create a new habit so that we don't continue to sin or do that behavior, that action. So what that means is we, we must... Uh, sanctification brings about a change or it transforms me. It, it, it causes me to be different, to walk in my new ways. And it does so through our thoughts and it does so through our actions. Revelation 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when I commit myself to Christ, I commit myself to that sanctification process, and that sanctification process wants to change or transform my life, my thoughts, and my actions. The second thing it does is it softens my heart. It softens my heart. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26a, God said to Israel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And then David in Psalm 51, after he uh, came back to Christ, after his sin with Bathsheba, he wrote this, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Change my heart. Soften my heart, God. When we allow things to harden our heart, it, it, it impedes the work and flow of God in our lives, and it, and it slows down the sanctification process. It slows down the cleansing process that God wants to do. And we're less apt to want to be able to take up our cross and follow Jesus because it takes commitment, commitment to that process to bring change and to soften our hearts. So what areas in your life, in your heart, do you need to soften? What areas of your life do you need to change? God wants to do a great work. The last thing I want to just briefly touch on is the cost. And, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot here, but a lot of times when we look at our relationship with the Father, we, we wonder, what's it going to cost me? What, what's in it for me? What, what, do I, what do I get out of this deal? And... Many of us understand and know that when we come to Christ, we receive our salvation, eternity, with forever with him. And, but we need to take it further than that. And, and, and it, it, it needs to cost us the surrender of our lives to the perfect will of God. Verse 24, when I read earlier out of uh, Luke 9, it said, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will save it. You see, we cannot gauge by what we lose, but by what we will gain. That's, that's what we gauge our relationship with Christ. Not by what we lose, but by what we gain. See, what we lose is a life of sin. What we lose is a life of shame. What we lose is a, is a broken heart, a busted attitude, a, um, a, a, a misguided direction. We, we lose all of that in order to gain new life, hope, peace, God's favor, God's blessing. And so instead of looking at it 
for something that we lose, we need to look at it for something that we gain. For when we surrender something in our own life, in order to take on what God will give us, we're not losing anything, but we are making an investment in the kingdom of God and adding to it in the span of eternity. In other words, whatever you lose, that's an investment. Because God will take that and he will, he will bless you with something better. But there are things in your life that you need to let go of. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. In other words, you're holding on to everything that you think you need. Surrender that to God. Whoever loses their life from me will save it. God will honor and bless. So I truly believe as we close this morning that there are some very powerful things that happen when we take up our cross. We must realize that we have a calling on our life. To follow, after, to follow after Christ with the message of the gospel to share with others as we are his ambassadors. And then we are called to be committed to the process that God takes us through to make us more like him. God bless you and I pray that as you think about what it looks like to be a follower of Christ, what it looks like to take up your cross daily, consider the cost Make a commitment to the calling that God has given to you to serve him and to follow after him. God bless you. May you have a great week. Please be praying for uh, service this coming week as we head into this Easter week and as we head into our Easter service on the 31st. God bless you, and we hope you can join us for that date. See you then. was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so oh washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you Please from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransomed He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on Darkness rejoiced, so heaven had won. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. 
Washes over.